divorce rate more than doubled after the introduction of no-fault divorce was that the law was now teaching that marriage need not be permanent. That you can get out of marriage for a trivial reason. That's why the divorce rate reached 50% and now it's leveled off around 45% in the U.S. The law shapes our culture. It shapes our cultural understanding of what marriage is and what it requires of spouses. And then it shapes how we act, how we live out. So first, there'll be no institution left that even upholds the ideal that a child deserves both a mother and a father. The Obergefell decision kind of teaches that men and women are functionally interchangeable and therefore mothers and fathers are replaceable. Uh, the second consequence is that I see no logical reason why the redefinition of marriage should stop here. Um, the four dissenting justices in the Obergefell decision say the same things. The Chief Justice is particularly um, uh, uh, aggressive on this point where he says, Justice Kennedy randomly inserts the adjective chu at various places in, in, in his majority opinion, but he never explains why marriage should be the union of two and only two consenting adults once you get rid of sexual complementarity. And already there are lawsuits in the federal court system arguing for a constitutional right to polygamy, and there are various new words that have been created to describe future redefinitions of marriage. So I just want to very briefly introduce you to three new terms. The first is the word thruple. A thruple is a three-person couple. Uh, take the word couple, chop off the C, and then add a THR. And the idea here is that if marriage is about consenting adult romance and caregiving, well, then three people can do that. Three men can live with each other and love each other. They can cook meals for each other. They can visit each other in the hospital. They can co-own a home. All three be on the mortgage. They can co-inherit property should one of them die. Every argument that was used to explain why marriage should be between two men can be used for a group of three men or a group of four. So during oral arguments, Justice Alito said, let's assume it's four people, two men and two women, highlighting the point that sexual orientation has nothing to do with this. Uh, two men and two women, he said, and all four of them are lawyers. So we don't have to worry about coercion. They can all give affirmative consent. And the question here is if you go to the Supreme Court and you say, I have a constitutional right to marry the person I love, why don't I have a constitutional right to marry the people I love? If marriage equality requires redefining marriage to allow the same-sex couple to get a marriage license, why doesn't justice require marriage equality for the same-sex throuple? That's the argument. About three weeks ago, a judge in a divorce case involving a throuple uh, granted all three adults joint custody of the child. Even though they hadn't been married, they had been living in an arrangement in which the three of them lived with each other, loved each other, and raising the child. And so as they were going through a breakup process, uh, the headline was, uh, Threpple Divorce Case uh, Grants Joint Custody to All Three of the Parents. And so again, you can see how these, con the, once you get a fundamental idea wrong, uh, it's a bad train of logic that we're now on. So that's Threpple. Uh, the second word was, and Threpple was originally coined in New York Magazine. So I first came across this term in New York Magazine, and they were describing three men who lived with each other in Brooklyn. And so what which was once kind of confined to the outer boroughs of New York is now uh, being made. Second, the term monogamish. Uh, this was a term in the New York Times in a profile of um, Dan Savage, uh, a gay rights activist. Mon monogamish is a play on the word monogamous, where you chop off the ending and you add an ish. And with this idea, what Savage is arguing is that we should have two-person pair couplings, because it's easier with it's two, but they should be sexually open. That monogamy, uh, as a requirement of two which has sexual exclusivity, is a bad idea. It runs counter to human nature, that we can't commit to one person till death do us part. And so what we need to do is be more realistic about our sexual desires and say we're going to commit to one person to share a home, but we're not going to commit to one person to share a bed. And he actually argued that this would make relationships work better because if your caregiving uh, and, and your homemaking would function better if you could fulfill sexual desires in other venues. There's no reason to think one person can fulfill all of our sexual desires. That's the argument there. And again, if marriage is about consenting at all romance and caregiving, what is the argument for why it has to be exclusive? Uh, why not? Uh, even Abimish. 
All right, the last term is the term wet lease. Wet lease is a play on the word wedlock. Wedlock kind of conjures up an image of something strong and sturdy and permanent and kind of lock in for life. Wet lease is meant to do the exact opposite. This was a term in the Washington Post about three years ago in an op-ed written by an attorney. And he said, just like you can lease a car or you can lease a house, you should be able to lease a spouse. Uh, his proposal was to have explicitly temporary marriage licenses. It would be optional, so you could sign up to have a permanent marriage license, wedlock, or you could sign up to have a five-year marriage license, a wed lease, which could then be renewed on good behavior. So if it's going well after five years, you can renew it. If it's still going well after 10, you can renew it. If it's not going well, you just walk away from it automatically. It already has a sunset clause. The argument here is that the problem of divorce is that we set ourselves up for unrealistic expectations. We think we're going to be with one person till death do us part, and we can't do that. And so we can't fulfill that obligation we made. Divorce breaks our heart, it ruins our finances, it messes up our, our expectations. But if we only expected a wet lease to begin with, we're just doing a five-year thing, and if it doesn't work out, well, after five years, we'll just go our separate ways, and we weren't expecting wet loss it would do away with the harm of divorce. All right, the thruple, the monogamous relationship, the wet lease. None of these authors in their original presentations ever talked about children. We're simply talking about the desires of the adults involved. That's the way in which we focus on them. And none of these arrangements have anything to do with sexual orientation. Again, just as many straight people have bought into this vision of marriage as a gay people. But what would be the consequence of buying into a throuple, a monogamous, a wet lease worldview about marriage? Well, what do these relationships do? They increase the number of sexual partners that adults have. Uh, the wet lease, you're going to have two sexual partners. The monogamous relationship, you're going to have multiple sexual partners. And then they decrease the amount of commitment that we make to our sexual partners. You make no commitment to your non spouse in the monogamous relationship, you make a five year commitment to your wet lease spouse. What's the end result? If you increase the number of sexual partners you have and you decrease the commitment to those partners, you increase the odds that you create children with multiple people to whom you are not committed. And therefore, you increase the odds that you create children to whom you will not be committed. And that from a policy perspective, why marriage mattered was that it got a man and a woman to commit permanently and exclusively to each other so that any children that might come from that sexual union would have both a mom and a dad. A throuple, a wed lease, a monogamous relationship, they increase those sexual partners, they decrease that commitment. The end result being a greater likelihood that children don't have a And yet, all of these consequences follow as a logical matter, just like night follows one day, once you get rid of the male-female part of marriage. Ask yourself this question, why Historically, it was marriage a monogamous, exclusive, permanent relationship. It's not because there's something magical about the number two. Because it's one man and one woman who can unite in a conjugal act that makes them one flesh. And every child has one mother and one father. And so the law was trying to get those people to be in a permanent, exclusive relationship. Once you say the male-female part of marriage doesn't matter, that it's arbitrary, it's irrational,